Thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Jeannie Yang, and I am the VP of Product Alchemy at SMULE. So Product Alchemy, first of all, is really just a simple way of acknowledging that product management really is all about doing whatever it takes to make a product come together from inception to development to launch to the users and recognizing that sometimes product management or the development is actually a really messy process and especially at a startup and so it's really all about learning from the lessons and it's really all about adapting to the various situations and the rapid changing environment that comes up and so at SMIL we call it kind of product alchemy because sometimes it's a little bit of a black magic and so sometimes we're trying to adhere to a practice and needing to adapt to the various ways that happens and certainly I think through my time there at SMIL it's been almost two years now I don't think a single product has really been the same as the last one and we always say we're going to learn from this one <laughs> we're going to go to the next one but something else always comes up so here today I, I mean I certainly don't think I've learned all the lessons and I probably never will and so but I've really taken a few to heart, I guess, from developing mobile social products at SMUEL. And most of them are obvious, but hopefully I can share our perspectives and maybe provide you with some insight. So please feel free to ask questions. I'm just gonna go through some of, I think, the most important lessons, and some of them are really obvious, but really how we've tackled them and how we approach them. And just first of all, a little bit about Smule. Smule's vision is to build social music making experiences through mobile apps. We've had over 17 million downloads of our, our apps collectively. Each of the apps we've built have explored the boundary of mobile on how people would use them. Our goal is really to unlock people's inherent creativity through audio by helping them realize what's possible which was previously um, they thought was impossible. That's really a mouthful and long-winded way of saying that we think everyone can make music and we want to make apps that help them realize that, even if they didn't know about it. And so here's Guy. This, he's our co-founder and creative director at SMIL, playing the Ocarina, one of the SMIL's first instrument apps on the iPhone. The Ocarina is actually an ancient flute-like wind instrument um, believed to date back over 12,000 years. So SMIL decided that 12,000 years later, there was no reason that the iPhone can't be a wind-like instrument as well. So I just want to play for you a little bit of go playing the ocarina. This actually takes quite a lot of skill to play. I have tried to play with it. You kind of definitely get a little bit um, head dizzy sometimes. You have to remember to breathe. It's just like any other wind instrument, even if it's on the iPhone. Um, and I think that's one of the lessons that we turn, we've really taken to heart. The key that Smil realized from the beginning was that it wasn't about the iPhone. It was all about what the iPhone can now enable people to do. And the best technologies are the ones that you don't notice. So we take this to heart in product design and reimagining what could be possible. So I think one of the first lessons, and this is probably the most obvious lesson, is to experiment and iterate. And I think we all do a lot of experimentation and iteration. I just want to show a few examples of how Smule does that. Um, so early on, one of Smule's first apps is uh, Smule created this app called the Attack to the Zombie Bikini Base from Outer Space. Um, it seemed to be the winning formula at the time. There were zombies, there were babes, there were babes in bikinis, there were slingshots and aliens, and it was sort of like, what can possibly go wrong in this? At its height, the app reached 496 in the app store. Um, so I think this is a lesson is, you know, in that don't be afraid to experiment. Have the courage to declare failure, learn, and move on. I think it was really um, good that Smil realized early that zombies and babes were not in the cards and to focus back more on the audio and the experience for the users. And also from this, we learn to user test early and often. Um, sometimes it's really hard to find that time to iterate and experiment, but it's really important and critical to even just pull a few users um, who have not seen your apps, who have not been there, and just give it to them and see what they think. I think another way that we iterate a lot, we, we actually start out when we have initial concept and idea with a paper sketch. Here's an early sketch of um, the idea for Magic Piano. 
which is an application on the iPad that lets you play piano. But we started out with questions to challenge the obvious. What if you had an infinite keyboard, and what if the piano never ended? And then we actually iterated there and created a higher fidelity concept mox. Then it was pretty much a bit of endless iteration, really rapid experimentation on what was possible and what the possibilities. How many touch points did the iPad have? This was really early on when the iPad first came out, um, and we didn't actually know how many touch points the iPad had, and it actually turned out to have 11 at that point in time, which required two people to test that out, unless you have your 10 fingers and your nose. And so it was sort of like a really fun experimentation to find out that there's actually 11 touch points. And then we just asked, is it possible to have a spiral key forward? Is this playable? Is it fun? And I think we found that we launched the Magic Piano on the iPad as one of the first iPad apps um, when the iPad launched. And with its bigger screen multi-touch points, we, it presented us an, an opportunity to, to challenge the users on what they thought of us as traditional piano and what they thought of they could play. Just want to take a step here. Like with all the endless experimentation and iteration, there's a lot of like because we're all heads down buried. Um, it's pretty important to take interludes in between. So I kind of want to just inject a little bit here, like sometimes the, the fun that we have when we develop it. This is us after we created Magic Fiddle, which was a fiddle app on the iPad that we launched last Christmas. We decided that we would go out caroling on the streets. We went to Fisherman's Wharf, was kicked out, did not realize you needed an artist license in order to play there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so these photos were gathered before we were kicked out, and then <laughs> we moved on to down the Cable Street cars. Turns out a lot of places need licenses if you want to play on the streets. Didn't realize that. <laughs> and the next one is um, we do a lot of late, late night hacking. Football. And sometimes, you know, Football. it can't be Football. all about development. We don't go to the gym very often. Yeah. And um, <laughs> we do have an exercise ball. And sometimes you just got to let out some energy, get some ins inspiration. This is Ga and one of the developers late, late at night at our office doing very dangerous things. <laughs> this actually did not stop Thorvald that night, <laughs> just so you know, even though some lights were, were. So I'm going to go on that. So that was just an interjection that, um, you know, when you're experimenting and iterating, just know that you should have fun. You should look to other places for your inspiration. Um, and sometimes you, you do have to let out some, some energy and <laughs> maybe get, get away from it to come back to it. Um, and now I think we come to the second point. Is that now that you've got a product, what's the business behind it? For anyone that's built an app here, I think you probably have gone through the initial reasoning behind whether you should launch an app as free or should launch an app as a paid app. What are you going to do with an in-app purchase and how that would affect your monetization strategy? Um, for us, we decided that earlier this year that we would take Magic Piano to the iPhone and we would launch it as a free app. It was Smeal's first free app. We All our previous apps before were paid. And we actually wanted just to test the experiment and what, um, just really a little bit quickly of what um, Magic Piano does. This is our video that we released when we launched Magic Piano. And so you can see the, the play mode is really just play songs. excited when the piano went free, <laughs> if, you, if you can't tell. Um, and not only that, was we found out that, we found out that free users paid. Um, this was something that we didn't really realize before, we didn't know if it was going to work, but free users paid. Users were paying for virtual currency inside the app in order to buy more Magic Piano songs to play. Um, and with free, the number of users that can grow um, and that can now get into the app was much, much higher than what we would have seen if the app was a paid app. Um, and so in terms of monetization, monetization, we're just su surprised at the percentage of users who are willing to pay and actually pay much more than if the app was just a 99 cent app. Because now within the app, we had different um, pricing packs for the virtual currency that went much higher than, than, the initial, than the initial 99 cent app would have cost. And so going free brought us more users and, and we made money. And that was actually a really big realization of experimentation on it. And we didn't actually do anything else inside the app but just take the original mechanic and add in virtual currency to it. And I think 
the third lesson that when we went free is one of the first lessons actually that we learned when we went free. We're really excited, but um, within the first two to three days, we we got an insurmountable amount of data. It actually melted down our data warehouse and our database. Um, so we were like literally blind because we were uh, within two to three days we had over 170 million events, and these were. So inside the app, we insert many events. I would be able to tell us what the users were clicking on, what screens they were going through. And um, literally within the first two to three days, it brought down our whole database. Not only that, our database was connected to our other core apps, so it brought down our other apps. This was a very unexpected um, thing. We were really excited. Our database melted. We had no idea what our users were doing. Our other apps were affected. This was a big data problem. And so it was something we weren't prepared for. And then also we realized that before we were just, we weren't being very smart about what data we were tracking. Um, we were literally actually instrumented every button click inside the application. So anytime you click, it, was, it would record and log an event and then send that up. But what we realized was that there were two button clicks, which is just go to screen and back from screen, which accounted for over 60% of all these events. And it was actually not informative, informative at all. I mean, people were going back and forth a lot, but what we really wanted to study was actually user flows through funnels of, of key user flows. And then we could have instrumented those much more smarter than just blindly instrument all the button clicks and thinking, oh yeah, we'll look at the data later. Um, so definitely what we learned here is that we could, if we had thought ahead about the time, about what the key user flows that we really wanted to study, we could have focused on instrumenting those, possibly not collected a ton of um, useless data and be able to not melt our database. But I think then back to the data point though is now that we have all this data and then going free is not just a simple pricing decision. Because now before we could count on at least a paid install and be sure that at least when the user bought the app they have some predis some inkling or predisposition to be engaged with the app because they know a little bit about what the app is about. They pay for it. With free all that goes out the window. And just because a user downloads the app now it doesn't mean we're going to make a sale. And so it required us really changing the way about thinking about how we deliver, measure, and tune our engagement before and after the app goes live, and especially after the app goes live. And because most often what we realize is what you launch the app with is not what you end up with, sometimes within even the first week. And so I just want to kind of show you how, in terms of tuning everything, we really had to kind of become rigorous about our business data and analyze it on a daily, weekly basis. Um, so we quickly adapted how we instrument and measure user engagement and monetization and kind of focus on a couple key metrics. And because now we can't just look at the ranking charts and the pay sales, we had to dig deep, monitor it on a daily basis. So just some example, like the daily active user is a key metric that we actually track a lot. And using that, you could actually start seeing that there are cycles and trends to when users come back to the app. And with a free, with the Magic Piano, we actually push new content and new songs out regularly. So now we plan on content release strategy in a way to maximize the new content, either to bring users back to the app when the active users are lowest, or to capitalize on premium content when we know that the users are highest and we'll push to them that there's a new premium content in the app. Oh, and then looking at, um, here's another one. We, the repeat versus first time user visit is actually really interesting a metric. We realized that very quickly that most of our daily active users are actually from the repeat users. And this is actually really interesting because most users actually make their pr first purchases within the first few sessions of the app. So that makes sense, right? If I bought, um, if I bought some coins, I'm going to come back and spend more at it. But the high values is still from users coming back. So, you know, this. This made us realize that we, before we were actually focusing on just one experience, getting people into the core, but this made us realize we actually had to focus and realize that there's a difference when people first come in, there's a first time user flow that we really have to engage with, and when we push people back, we actually have to figure out how to max maximize the repeat users, how to give them more interesting things to do, and possibly even show them different storefront, different songs, different things in order to engage them more. So. Another thing that we look at a lot is sort of the lifetime value of the user. And so knowing the lifetime value of the user helps us to plan and understand the value of our business. So at high level, the lifetime value of user is the value of your user spend in the app minus your cost of acquisition. That's easier said than done for free. And 
because with paid, at least we know that every user had an initial value. With free, many more variables uh, are playing into the calculation. So we don't have a simple formula. And what we do is a bit of uh, guesswork, intuition, and logic thrown in right now. But I kind of want to show you like some of the key monetization metrics that we track. Um, the dollars per active user. So this is across all boards, all, across all the active users, dollars per active users is actually a metric that we, just, we monitor constantly and on a weekly level. Again, you can see the cyclic values of the dollars per active users. If our active users increase, but our dollar value drop, then this could indicate that we're not acquiring users from the right channels. They're not coming in um, with the intention to play. Maybe it's coming, we're acquiring them from another channel where they're just launching the app and leaving. Or maybe there's something else that we're not doing. Um, another value that we look at is the dollars, um, the average value per purchase. Of the people that purchase, what is the average value that's going on? So monitoring this trend kind of lets us know whether we're pricing our in-app purchases optimally and tuning accordingly. Just want to show a case study. This is one thing. So this is our store inside the app, inside Magic Piano. These are the virtual currency packs that people buy. Um, you can pay different prices to get more virtual currency packs. We actually did several iterations based on tuning and data analysis to see what order to place the packs in, what is the price value of the similar packs. When we initially launched, we actually had a 99 cent value, a 99 cent pack immediately. So you can see that we tried a 99 cent followed by a 299, we tried 99 followed by 199, and we did a 199 entry, and then we continued to iterate on this. This is one of our first iterations. So you can see that when there, there's a 99 cents, we had 276 per transaction, but when we had 199 entry, we actually had a higher value per average value per transaction overall. And so it was actually a surprising thing to learn that having a higher price point for entry actually did not lower our monetization and actually increased it. It was kind of counterintuitive because we felt like you know, we must have a 99 cent pack for all the people who didn't want to spend more 99 cents. And so if you notice that now, when I showed you that last screenshot, we now actually ended up at 299 as our first entry point pricing. And this took a lot of iteration and testing. We, we spent several weeks of looking at the data. And definitely there's, there are possibly flaws. But this is like one of the things I realized we, we need to play with. <laughs> I think the, the fifth point, and here's another hard lesson we learned, registration really sucks. We went free, and we were like, we're going to get all these free users. We really need their data, because we need, really need a way to contact them. And so we got to put in register. We got to put in registration barriers. And so this is this is a hard struggle and a design philosophy for for us. Most of our apps are you could get in right into it. You could start playing immediately. Registration is really an optional thing, and registration on mobile is painful. Registration is painful everywhere. It's especially more painful on mobile. And so we really. But the other aspect of it is that registration is so good for the user. They just don't know it. If they register, they keep all their songs, they keep all their performances, they won't lose it if they delete the app or reinstall, they just don't know it. So we felt like, OK, well, we're going free. We, we need to at least throw up a registration barrier. So what we did, and this is a, a, a very bad thing that we learned. So registering it sucks. It was a hard lesson that we learned. We put in a registration barrier right before they could exchange their smooth for songs. It was a very logical reasoning at the time. We let them buy their Smula packs without registering. Of course, you spent your money. Go spend your money. Uh, but if you're going to use it, you got to register. But of course, you're going to register. At this point, you've already had the intent to buy. So don't you want to use it? And to use your, <laughs> to use your Smula, you have to register. Um, not really. Uh, <laughs> people were um, getting into the login. And so sorry about all the numbers, but the, the actual drop off is we were getting 20% of the users <laughs> successfully registering. This, this really sucked. I mean, we, we love that they gave us money, but really want them to be engaged and play with the app and really use up more of it. And um, so this is an incredibly painful thing. This is something we're definitely still trying to learn and figure out better and trying to figure out like what is the right balance of registration? When is the right time to throw it up? Um, do we just do it you know, blatantly from the beginning? Do we sneak it in on them? Um, and we haven't, to be honest, found the, found the right answer. And um, it, it's a hard one, because <laughs> we really want to talk to our users. Um, this kind of brings me to, our, to my sixth point, which is, and last point, at, at the end of the day, it's all about the users. Whatever we do, design, build, it's really nothing if the users aren't delighted by it. 
And so at SMIL, our philosophy is that our chief marketing officers are our users. Um, so this shows, this is a kind of a video wall of users who, ha who are using our app. On the left side is users who are using the, the IM T-Ping app, which is a, it auto-tunes your voice. People created videos in themselves, uploaded it to there. On the right initially is when, uh, just a ton of people playing the ocarina. Um, and we've done a lot of studies on this, and really, it's fairly obvious, but at the end of the day, the most powerful recommendation is um, words from your word of mouth from friends. And so if someone would, would sh just show a friend their app, or even just like, hey, go check it out, that is the most powerful recommendation. And when people come in, they're the most engaged. So if obviously, users are very important. And I think that's this, the last point here that I want to make is that with our, within our apps, our systems, it's all about enabling the social connections. And maybe it's a little bit hard to imagine, so I want to kind of show the case study through our Glee karaoke app. So just really quickly, this is the Glee karaoke app. It was built in conjunction with Fox, which has a Glee television show about people singing in Glee clubs. And so for us, this, this really aligned with our vision about people singing together. So it's basically a singing app, which pitch, it pitches cards to you and harmonizes your voice and vi visualizes the lyrics. But it also, what, what we did is that it allows you to sing with your friends. It, allows you to join any song from anyone in the world, um, just freely. You could, you could record a song and invite your friend to join it, or you could go to the Globe. You could go to the Globe, find someone's performance, and just click join and add your voice on top of it. So you could instantly create duets, massive group songs, etc. So when we were first building Glee, what we really initially wanted to focus on, what we thought was, would be the most compelling thing, is friends. Uh, people inviting their friends to sing with them, going, hey, you know, join me on a song and sing happy birthday. And that's really the use case that we thought would be the most compelling and the most interesting. And that was really the social that we really focused on. But I think as, as Glee has grown and what we've seen, seen learn from the app, there are actually three levels of social connections that naturally happen. And so recognizing these levels of social connection and designing the products to enable them, each level is something that, that we have learned from Glee. So, I want to show you the three levels of connection. The first is very obvious. It's just, first, users should be able to use the app to connect with their own family and friends. So here's an example of a performance of a three-year-old singing with her uncle, who lives across twinkle, the country. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, star how, I how I wonder what you are. Up, 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 up the world so, so high, like, like a diamond in the sky. In the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. <laughs> so you can see the uncle lives in Baria, and the niece lives cross country. Um, so this is an example where, honestly, for the niece, she's three years old. It wasn't about the application on the iPhone. She's just singing with her uncle. And for her uncle, this is a song that she sent her niece. And you know, it really wasn't about the timing. She was quite off, <laughs> but you know, but it's really about the scene together, and now they have this experience that they wouldn't normally have, and it's on the world. So that's the first level of social connection. But the second level of social connection is that users should be able to make serendipitous connections that were not possible before. Um, here's a performance of four strangers in four different locations who met on the app and then decided to get together to create an a cappella quartet performance uh, Mr. Sandman, and I just want to point out that one's in UK, one's in Australia, and then two are in the US somewhere. This is Mr. Sandman by the Cordettes. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream, make him the cutest that I've ever seen. Give him to us like roses and clover And tell him that his lonesome nights are over Sandman, I'm so alone So this is actually really surprised us. I mean, we hoped for it, but we didn't think this would happen. And these people found each other through the app, made connections somehow by leaving comments on their performances, connected, and decided to get together and create a song. And then this song, 
And actually, we didn't make this easy for them at all within the app. The first person has to lay down the track, send it to the next person who lays down their track, send it to the next person who lay down their track. And it's all through just listening to it by year and timing it correctly. This is an a cappella performance. So there's nothing helping them on the screens. And um, it was shocking. People were making friends. <laughs> People were making social connections that, that, that we didn't th think was possible. We didn't make easy for them. And they were doing it despite of us. And that was amazing. And that was something that, that we, we knew that we actually should have um, tried to help. And that's actually in the future designs of our product. It's something that we consider a lot. Another thing I just want to note here is that when we launched Glee, we actually realized this was another surprising thing, that people were actually much more willing to share their performances with strangers than with their friends. So our initial assumption totally went out the window as well. People were so, so, so shy about their singing. And they were like, no, I'm not going to share with my friends. They're just going to make fun of me. <laughs> but they were perfectly happy to go onto the globe, share with other people, and find other connections and do it that way. So. And I think lastly, I think the last point is that we want to be able to create a social system where users could to participate together as a community um, without barriers. So here's an example. The day after the earthquake happened in Japan, um, one of our users from Glee Karaoke posted this post on our Facebook wall. She's basically, she has sang a song, Lean On Me. She has started that song, Lean On Me, in Glee Karaoke, and was asking for people to join her song from anywhere, strangers from all over the world. Um, we saw this post, we just put in an app so it's easy for users to find, and we honestly did not know what would happen. The song has now over 3,000 singers, and let me just go straight into the song. incredibly amazing and un unexpected for us. When we first built Glee, we were like, oh my gosh, it's going to sound terrible if, if anything went over 10 people join it. The timing is going to be off. The audio recording is going to be off. It's just going to be terrible. But, but we were like, OK, well, but maybe that's probably something that won't happen. I mean, it's going to take a lot for people to join it. And, the, and then you can see from here, this is like over 3,000 singers. Like once everyone's voice is joined together, it actually didn't matter Like if your timing was off. There were comments on the song, people saying, you know what, I didn't ever think I was singing the song. And it, but it didn't really matter. It was just being part of the song. I really just wanted to join to be a part of the song and have my, know my voice is part of it, even though it's not the one that stands out. Um, and so this really taught us that you know, creating a system that, allow, that allows these people to participate together is really incredibly important for people to come together in unexpected ways. And so I think I just want to leave on the last quote is that from Mark Weiser, the most profound technologies are the ones that disappear. Um, and that's sort of how we approach product design development. That's it.